It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Sean Thompson all the way from the United Kingdom. Sean would refer to himself as a slow starter, but eventually he went on to gain his postgraduate diploma in maxillofacial prosthetics and technology at Manchester University while working in the orthodontic and maxillofacial laboratory at Sunderland Royal Hospital. In 2003, he achieved the only highest possible grade passed with distinction to date in this specialty, earning him a coveted award from his national body in the process. Prior to this, Sean had studied for four years to gain his dental technology qualification and a further four years at Newcastle for his advanced certi certificates in orthodontic technology and also prosthodontic technology. Sean has gained a reputation that is second to none in the field of orthodontic technology, and he was appointed to the National Council of Orthodontic Technicians Association in 2012 in recognition of this. Sean established Ashford Orthodontics in 2001 due to specialist clinicians needing laboratories specializing in orthodontic technology rather than having to send their work to general laboratories, which simply dabble in the specialty. Two new directors in Craig Stevens and Graham Winyard joined in 2005 when Ashford became a limited company. And between them, they have over 75 years worth of experience in this field. Ashford employs over 50 highly skilled members of staff and bases its success on the quality of the work they produce being directly linked to the quality and training of the staff they employ. Sean has been instrumental in steering the company through its recent successes, seeing Ashford invest heavily as an early implementer in digital technology, forming the Retainer World brand in the process, allowing Ashford to create and secure diverse income streams into the lab. This deliberate business model has resulted in rapid but sustainable growth in the last few years and has firmly established Ashford as a leading light in the field. Ashford is now the technical strength behind various other companies, allowing it to expand in the field of 3D scanning and printing, which it turned as allowed to export to Scandinavia, Belgium, Netherlands, Australia, and New Zealand. You know, I don't see the United States on that. Have you got any United States customers yet? We've actually in the process, in the process, can't say too much. Well, we're going to get you one today. We'll just, we'll just get you <laughs> one today. It'll be somewhere between Kansas and Missouri. The company continues to expand following its 17 years of continuous growth inception and is currently in discussion to increase its income streams further. So we're, we're basically the same age. We graduated from school the, the same time, basically. Um, um, gosh, Invisalign has really changed orthodontics. I mean, I mean, I can't, when I look at orthodontics, I mean, that has to be the single greatest factor that's happened to orthodontics since I got out of school three decades ago. Would you agree or disagree? Oh, I'd entirely agree with that. And I think it's actually been the leading light for other people to change the way they work. So everybody's been trying to play catch up. And I think it's one of those ones where everybody's doing that now. We're all kind of using similar technology and um, just not on the same scale as uh, Invisalign, but pretty much the way um, Align Tech is the the hub behind Invisalign, that's kind of what we're starting to be. Um, we're starting to deal with smaller clients, but basically do the same type of thing. We, it, we're all using the same technology. It's just trying to make it, what we found was make it affordable and available to ordinary people, particularly as in the US, you don't have something called our National Health Service, um, where you get free treatment um, and, and everything's done kind of insurance in the US. Um, we have the similar type of system where we call them private patients, but primarily orthodontics in, in the UK um, is mainly funded through our National Health Service. And it can sometimes be seen as a second tier service compared to private. You get what you're given and um, you don't really have a great choice. And we decided that we would do something different about that. We would try and make it affordable and available to everybody, even on the National Health Service. So yeah, Invisalign has been great in that because it's actually set the, the bar for us to raise too. I always hold up my hand when, when some guy tells me they got a new idea, I say it's gotta be five things. It's gotta be faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, and miniature. I mean, the first steam engine was in uh, your country, but it was so damn big, all it could do was take uh, water out of flooded coal mines. But as it got faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, and smaller, eventually that thing fit on a ship, and then you had the whole ship the transatlantic shipping business. Then when it got to America, they had to build canals. So, so everything is about doing it faster, easier, higher quality, lower costs, and more miniature. And healthcare has a hundred-year tradition of 
um, every time the earth goes around the sun to raise all your prices 5%. And so it's interesting to see how you're um, admitting and realizing that if you can bring down the cost of this, it will reach more people. Absolutely right. Um, you know, that, that's more prevalent in the UK with the NHS, the National Health Service. But the whole ethos behind this is exactly what you've just said, Howard. If you can make it affordable, then you'll make it available to more people. And therefore, if it's a benefit to those people, you don't want to put a financial barrier in there. And the way it works in the UK is the um, clinicians who we deal with, the orthodontists, um, they have a budget. They have a price to work within. And what is and that that's price? Crazy. Sorry? And what is that price? It, it varies. We have something called units of orthodontic activity. And each clinician will apply to the National Health Service for a contract to see X number of patients for X number of years at X number of pounds. And they get given that in the form of units of orthodontic activity. So the contract can range from a few hundred units of orthodontic activity up to many thousands. Um, but equally, there's times of austerity worldwide. And it's not a bottomless pit with the NHS. Everybody has to justify what they're doing now. So essentially, everybody gets given a pie. It's not like you have to bake your own pie with ingredients. You're given that pie. You have to actually cut it up, slice it up wisely, and eat it at a, at a measure that's going to last you one, two, three years. Um, so we're trying to make sure that um, that pie lasts a bit longer. So that's what we decided to do. Yeah. And are you doing uh, clear aligners or are you doing bracket systems too? We do all of them. Yeah, we do all of them. So what, what, um, is, what is the market? What what is it about 80% brackets and wires and 20% clear aligners? Yeah, on the NHS, um, it's virtually all brackets and it tends to be kind of stainless steel brackets. Um, you still get exactly the same treatment. You'll get exactly the same result and there's some fantastic results. Um, the difference is with the NHS, the clinicians have to be governed by what they can spend per patient to fulfill their contracts. Um, so they have to look for the most cost effective alginate or impression material. So rubber base isn't going to happen. Um, so they're trying to find ways of servicing this contract to a very good standard. But in it also it has to be affordable for everybody. They have to make a living. Everybody has to make a living. But nobody wants to see a second class service to the NHS patients. And what, and is, what is the NHS, what, what is it paying for the average case? What, what would what, the, sorry? How, how much money would the average dentist in the UK get for an ortho case? So about how many pounds would it be? In I'm not sure case? because they keep that figure very close to their chest. So I'm not really sure. It depends again on the size of the practice and how many patients they've got. Um, but I know there's measures in place now where it's down to how many children and it tends to be under the age of 19. So there's around about a million patients per year in the UK qualify for free NHS treatment. Um, free what? To treatment? qualify free for free NHS treatment, so they don't pay for it. It's it's. But yeah, what did you used to call it? Free Energest? A NHS. National oh, NHS. Health free yeah. NHS. So one million children in the UK are under 19 and qualify for free NHS yeah. dentistry. That's correct, yeah. Okay. How you qualify that varies in different areas down to um, oral health and the, the severity of the malocclusion. So it really depends on, on which level they come in at. But if they qualify, um, it's up to the clinicians then to be able to service that contract and get a really good result after 18 months, two years, and then keep the teeth looking nice as well. So they, they've got a duty of care that they don't just get the teeth straight and then they disappear and the ch child doesn't wear the retainers. So all of that is the aftercare as well. And they have to they have to have a financial provision in place to make that happen. Um, so they're being squeezed. You know, it is hard for them at present. So that they're trying to make ends meet. And we came along to try and fill a gap for that, really. So what technologies have you adopted that you think is making orthodontic treatment for the NHS faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost? Um, at present, we probably do around about 85% of all of our orthodontic cases, the retention and everything at the end of it, um, via the traditional alginate impression material route. And we do now we do about 15% digitally. Um, we do around about 8,000 orthodontic retainers per month, which is quite a few. Um, but what we've done is we've tried to 
provide the technology digitally to make it affordable and available. So instead of having to send us via courier or post these traditional alginate impressions, we receive the scans. You've, you've seen them out there, Itero, and I don't know if I'm allowed to name them, Itero, CareStream, Trios. They're all out there and the clinicians now are investing in these because they know the accuracy is better. Um, but can we then combine that into they don't want to pay more to have that service. So could we combine the service that we can provide to them digitally for the same cost as it would cost them to send it via traditional alginates? Um, and that's what we've tried to do by in implementing digital technology on a, on a large scale. So um, when you talk about the, the scans, when you talk about um, iTero, um, CareStream, um, tri uh, trios, um, th those are big investments. So um, Itero is owned by Align uh, yeah. um, and Trios. So if some dentist was listening to you right now from around the world and said, dude, these are expensive, which what they would know which one you recommend. Um, we don't actually have a preference where we can take scans from all of them. Any scanner out there, we can receive them. The vast majority of the ones that we get at present are the three that you've just named, but primarily Itero being the, the most popular one. And I think it's because of the connection with Invisalign. So a lot of the National Health Service orthodontists have a fulfillment to, to treat the patients under that contract, but then they also have an obligation to treat patients who want to go privately and maybe miss waiting lists out. So the Itero scanner takes both boxes. Um, but what we're finding now, and this is kind of really the, the basis of what we're doing, is we've now got three large orthodontic practices who don't have any impression material in their practices, So, which was unheard of. The thought of that actually happening to do everything digitally was just a year ago probably wouldn't have happened. And now we've, we've gone from one to two to three practices and more people trying it now. So they've invested in the scanner, which is the expensive bit. They kind of need that for their private patients to do Invisalign and stuff like that. Um, but actually, can they implement that to the National Health Service as well and give every patient that opportunity? They could only do that if they could find a laboratory such as ourselves that could provide that technology for the same cost as it would cost them to do it via traditional routes. And that's where we've kind of made a breakthrough. Go back to... Um the big dollar question about buying a scanner because um, you know it, it is a lot of money for the dentist and we know on dental town that when you're thinking about buying a CAD cam or a CBCT you know they spend hours and hours just on that one topic reading everything um, I know iTero and Trios um, iTero is owned by um, Align Technology in America and uh, Trios is uh, three owned by Three Shape in uh, Copenhagen Denmark um, those two have been kind of arguing and fighting amongst themselves and in courts. Um, does any of that matter to the dentist or the lab person? I mean, are they open systems? Does it not matter? I mean, I mean again, I'm, I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to help this dentist decide which system to go to. Yeah, I mean, the Itero one is a closed system. You have to sign up to it and you have to be um, pay a fee. It will cost you every month to, to kind of have an Itero, um, but it also allows you to use Invisalign. Um, the other systems, as you well know, like you've just said there with the TRIO system, um, it was in, it was out. There's all sorts going on with that. So um, other systems haven't been accredited by, um, by Invisalign. So when you come to pay that money for the investment, you want one that's going to tick all the boxes. And at the minute, court case is pending, um, the iTero one ticks the boxes because although you pay for your file system and your monthly fees, it does open all the doors for you. Whereas, you know, you're taking a bit of gamble with the other ones because they're excellent scanners, um, open file systems through CareStream and everything. But actually, if you want to send them to Invisalign, then it becomes difficult. Although you could always send it to a lab to print a model and send the models to Invisalign. I think that's a way around it. So, so you're saying iTero is a closed system and it's owned by Align Technology and they only want to support Invisalign. And so, and so, so then what is Trios trying to go to court to force them to take three shape scans or what, what is, what is the court dilemma about? Um, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head there. I think that's what it is. They want to open up their, their users to be allowed to send their scans via the Trios to um, Align Tech to, to use the Invisalign system. Um, you know, there's connections in there with the um, incognito system as well, the, the lingual systems. So there was a little bit of you scratch hours 
our back wheel scratch yours, and I think that's gone a little bit sour with patents and and things. So there's a whole minefield there, and I think that's what the, what they're trying to do is, if you allow our files, we allow your files, and everybody lives happily ever after. But there's obviously lots going on out there, which is beyond us. I think. Well, you know, yeah. it, it's um every you know I I don't look at things as right, wrong, up, down, left, right. I mean, every, an engineer looks at everything as a trade off. I mean. Um, you know, like Apple's a very close system, but it's very easy to work and all that stuff. Google and Microsoft are very open systems. So there's all advantages of that, but yeah, more bugs and viruses. And, and I, I've seen Dennis who bought the, um, the, the closed system CVCT um, at a dense fly Serona where it's all closed, but everybody in the office knows how to use it because it's all one system and it's real easy. And then other people want to open system Say buy a CBC from one company, a CAD from another company. They add all this open technology, but then when you walk in the office, you ask your assistant, "We'll do this," and you say, oh, I, "I don't know how." So then, so then, if your number one cost is labor, and you have this open system, but then you're, you know, so the bottom line is, are you just getting it done? Are you getting it done, and are you getting it done faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, cheaper? So I, you know, it, it, everything's just a trade off. It'll be interesting to watch how these court decisions play out, but. I certainly don't know why how a government could force Invisalign to use another company's scanner. I mean, I just don't. I don't know if that's the place for government. I don't but, know. Yeah. but I hate. I hate talking religion, politics, sex, or violence. Um, so, so, but you're saying um, if you're going to do uh, a lot of Invisalign, get the uh, its own byline technology, get the Itero, you're having no problems with the CareStream or the Trios uh, from Three Shape no, either. Yeah. But what about yeah. 3M's uh, True Depth scanner? Do you see that much? Yeah. Yeah, we do scans, probably about six or seven different types of scanners. And you, you have to pay sometimes a fee to one to accept their files. You have to you have to upgrade your software to accept other files. So there's different ways that you have to pay to, to receive these, even though they're in kind of open systems. You have to have the technology within the lab to do that. Um, most people have signed up to it and you accept that it's kind of part and parcel of what you've got to do. Um, but from our side of it, we're not really bothered at all which scanner you've got. Um, if you want to send it and use the technology, then we can receive it. And that's kind of what we've based our business around. Yeah. Well, money's the answer. What's the question? I mean, I, I, I could listen to all the philosophical arguments. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, look, look at the x-ray. The x-ray machine was out forever and dentists weren't using it until Delta Dental came along. It's called the Longshoreman's uh, Dental Insurance Plan in the Northeast, Oregon, Washington, California, which really turned into the first Delta about 1948. They covered x-rays at 100%. Oh, well, the dentists were like dominoes. I mean, from coast to coast, all of a sudden, who's this Renkin guy? Really? Uh, I, I need that machine. So at the end of the day, money is the answer. What's the question? And what I don't understand with some of these systems like Take True Def, it's like, okay, you're owned by 3M. So I'm supposed to buy a seventeen thousand dollars scanner to avoid having to buy Impergum, which I've been using since nineteen eighty four, and yeah. and they say, oh, but you have to have a two hundred dollar a month license. Well, shit, am I even buying two hundred dollars a month of Impergum? And yeah. uh, you know, so uh, at what point? So money is the answer. So as it gets faster, easier, higher quality, lower price, but you're obviously gonna need some volume. So you have three yeah. orthodontic practices, so they're totally digital, but they must have yeah. great volume. It's not like a dentist where yeah. five or 10% of the revenue is ortho. I mean, this yeah. is an orthodontic practice, so it's it's 100% uh, down yeah. and out ortho. So are, are, exactly are, you, are you seeing the future of the all digital practice just with orthodontists? Yeah, we, we just have specialist practices just doing orthodontics. And, and obviously because they've got the contract with our National Health Service, then that's what their speciality is. They don't do anything else. They refer outwards for everything else. Um, you know, from, from their side of things, they literally do 100% ortho and they need to get patients into treatment. They need to be able to, um, the Impergum is absolutely fine. It's, it's, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But what they are seeing the benefits of is that you get a more accurate scan and a more accurate model to work on given the scan that you're using. Plus, the speed of treatment, we haven't got to ship impression materials in. It comes in instantly. The kind of the geographic boundaries have gone. It's not a case of we've got to get something from Scotland down to anywhere in the UK. It can come in instantly. So, so there's a major benefit there that you're saving at least 24 hours on, on that. You don't have to travel with the Imbricum, the Alginate. It, it's not 
pretty much stable these days, but you don't have that issue with the scans. So if you can, particularly for retention, the quicker you can get the retainers into the mouth at the end of treatment, the better it is for everybody, you know, because all the, all the hard work's gone if it, the teeth drift. Now, um, how so. are you making your money in, in these orthodontic prices? Are you selling the clear aligners or are you selling the retainers or how, what, what is your business model? Yeah, it tends to be the retainers, the retention element plus refinement aligners at the end. Um, so, so, so we can do Invisalign for the clear aligners. No, we, we, we use actually three shapes software. Um, the ortho analyzer product, we use their software to, to do the manipulation on the models. So we can use their software to move the teeth on the STL file. And then we can print a series of models which will create the sequential aligner system, which is very similar to Invisalign. So it's, Okay, so it's, the orthodontic practices you're using that aren't using Invisalign then? If they're the, these three that you're talking about that are all digital? Yeah, the, the, they're using Invisalign for their private patients. But for the prime, for the NHS patients, they tend to use brackets. But then when it comes to the end of the treatment, if they have some kind of refinement aligners, you've got one or two stubborn teeth which just won't move, then they can use the software that we do just to, to do a little mini series uh, of, of aligners at the end of the treatment if they wish. Yeah. And, and when it comes to money, orthodontics is a game about retention not straightening i mean i mean straightening up some teeth is pretty damn easy but when you take yeah. those wires and brackets off if you know if yeah. everything relapses that's the problem what, what, what i mean do you, do you agree that orthodontics is a game of retention oh absolutely when i first started in this maybe 35 years ago they used to be wear the retainers just for kind of a couple of months and you'll be fine and, and now as it's gone on, retention is for life, you know, so it doesn't really matter if you're using Invisalign or if you're using fixed brackets, you still need retention at the end of it. And I think the quicker you can get retention onto the patient's mouth, then they've been through a lot of time and a lot of treatment time to get the nice straight teeth. The, the real thing, like you've just said, is keeping them there, keeping the patient motivated to keep wearing the retainers and provide the, the best quality retainers. If you've got a retainer, which is just a removable retainer and it costs X number of pounds, if you can go out there and provide two types for the same price as one type, for example, you can put a fixed wire bonded retainer and a removable retainer for the same price what traditionally people paid for one retainer, you've got what we call the belt and braces approach. You've got much more chance of getting a compliant patient. If they lose their removable retainer, if they've got a fixed wire on the back, then they have time. We can print another STL file, get a, 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 another model made, send the retainer directly out of them. But in the meantime, they've got the wire retention on the back. So if we can make that affordable, so practices start using both types of retention, then actually you've got a much better chance of keeping the teeth straight for the longer term. And that's what we decided to do. We decided to use digital technology in order to produce a very cost-effective model so we could provide all types of retention at a much more affordable price to encourage clinicians to use that. And that's where we've been successful. Like you said, if you're gonna make a little bit off something, you need a lot. And that's kind of the way we've set it up. We make a lot, a little bit off a lot. You know, another thing I want to tell these uh, young kids, because mo most people listen to podcasts for millennials, but, um, you know, if you go back, uh, you know, I'm 56. So if you go back to when I was little, those big post-World War II families, five, six, uh, kid, five and a half kids for a family, you could only afford the most serious malocclusion on a woman to get treated. I mean, orthodontics was, you got seven kids and one daughter is so messed up, no one's ever going to marry her. Um, you know, so we're, we're just going to fix up Susie. And now with birth control, families going from five and a half kids to under two, um, orthodontics is just, uh, it's the, the, everybody wants it. And yeah. so, so when people, when I'm looking at these Wall Street estimates on Invisalign and I'm looking at their projections, what, what they need to focus on is a trend line between orthodontics in the 60s being very expensive and needs-based done to just the ugliest kid in high school to now it's ortho for life i mean i see i see people coming in all day long she's 40 years old she just got this slightly crooked tooth and and she and i mean you would never have done ortho for that in 1960. So, so I, I, I see, um, I, I, I think these Invisalign trays, these clear liners, people, I, I think the ortho demand is going to go up high. And, and the most shocking for me 
was, um, you know, I've done these uh, podcasts from, I don't know, 20, 30 uh, countries, but, but even in very, very poor countries, I mean, I was in Cambodia, um, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, and the girls at the, the, the waitresses at the bar, when they found out what we were dentists, that's all they want to know about was Invisalign. And, and then she knew this other girl had done it. I said, was, and she pointed to her, so I brought her over here. Anyway, long story short, I started doing the math. This woman was probably 18. She paid $1,000 for clear aligners, and I'm figuring her yearly income was probably 3000 a year. I mean, she's paying a third of her money for, for so, so this, this, this orthodontic, this cosmetic uh, market, um, which really uh, was started by, uh, I think, Ivoclair. I think it was Bob Ganley, Ivoclair, who just uh, who just went from uh, CEO to uh, chairman of the board with uh, Ivoclair. He, uh, he's stepping down and turning the reins over. But I, I think this cosmetic revolution that he started in the early 90s, it's still going, 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 going. And I'm even and now it's also transcending more into men. I mean, 30 years ago, you would have never had a 70 year old man one to bleach his teeth. And now, and now they're, they're, they're talking about it. So, so do you see yeah. that continued growth? Oh, absolutely. You know, our, our NHS service, our national health service is for children under the age of 19, if they're in full-time education, but we're doing as many now privately with adult patients wanting exactly what you've just said there, you know, tiny little tweaks, a little tooth crossed over another one. We're seeing lots and lots of that adult orthodontics. Um, but we just made the decision that it doesn't really matter if it's adults or children, you still need good retention. And if we can do really good retention, we can make it affordable. It doesn't matter if you've used if you've used Invisalign, if you've used any of the systems out there or a fixed system. If you can kind of help the people out there who've had the treatment, like the lady you've just said, she's paying a thousand dollars out of a three thousand salary to get her teeth straightened. She also has to be able to afford the retention at the end of it. Otherwise, she looked really good for a short period of time and she'll be back to where she was. So we've got to make sure that everybody can get that best retention out there. That's why we set up the Retainer World brand. It was to make it affordable to everybody. So if, if you're using Invisalign, what, why don't you just, you, you, you're obviously sending things to the States to get made, but with now with digital technology, you've removed the geographic boundaries. So if we've got any clinicians in Europe or in the UK who are using other systems like that, then you know if we can speed up their options for retention and be able to provide them with a more cost-effective method to keep the teeth straight, then it's a win-win for everybody, and that's what we've kind of decided to do. Yeah. So, what website should they go to to find out about your retainer brand? Is that AshfordOrthodontics.co.uk? That's the one. Yeah, Ash Retainer World is now a wholly owned subsidiary of Ashford Orthodontics. Um, it was growing so much that we basically brought it back in house and we made sure it belonged to us. So Ashford Orthodontics has its Retainer World brand, which is a value based system. Um, we wanted to make sure that everybody has that option. If it's a better form of retention to have um, a wire bonded retainer as well as a removable one, we didn't just want that to be offered to private patients. We wanted that to be able to be offered to NHS patients as well. And that's kind of where we, we based our business around that. Um, it's the way forward, I think. Like you've just said, the popularity has never been as great and it's only continuing. So we've got to make sure that we have a responsible attitude to that, that we don't just take the money, straighten the teeth, and then you know see them for six months and then what happens after that is up to them. We've got to basically make sure that retention is for life and we've got to provide them with the best options at the best price that we can do it. Well, your uh, um, Twitter is uh, my homies are listening to me. They're driving to work, so I uh, I retweet your website on Twitter. Thank you for uh, the twenty three thousand dentists following me on uh, Twitter. That's pretty damn cool. Uh, so the website <laughs> is uh, AshfordOrthodontics.co. Dot UK. UK. Um, yep. And I uh, you also need to get an Instagram picture on this. Uh, only the you have uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. That's great, but the millennials, man, they're on uh, they're on Instagram. They're they're running I think away we from have Instagram. I think there is one. Oh, it's not it's not on the site. 
Oh, all right, we'll have to get that. We do have we have our guy who looks after the Instagram yeah, account. The, uh, if, you're, if you're yeah. a grandpa like me, you're on LinkedIn, and if you're uh, <laughs> and if you're uh, under thirty, you're on Instagram. Uh, so I also noticed you have a picture on your website of Form Labs um, on yes. your website. Um, why why yeah. is that picture there? What what are your thoughts on Form Labs? We have the largest bank of Form Labs printers in the UK. Um, there's so much technology out there. When we started with this technology kind of five, six years ago, we kind of, what we think was a mistake, we went after the biggest, the best printers with the biggest build platforms that we could build everything on in one go and get them on and off quickly. Um, that, that ticks the boxes in certain ways, but equally you can't just have one of these big beasts, you have to have two, because if one goes down, you need a backup. So you have to have these big beasted printers and you have to have them and run them at 50% knowing that if one goes, you've got cover. Um, the way we run our business out is that any scan that we receive up till 3 p.m. in the afternoon will be printed that night. We will print it that night. We will manufacture the retainer the next day and send it out. So then we decided, how can we get a more cost-effective model, um, 3D printed model? And that's where Form Labs came in. They're not the fastest printers. They're probably not the most accurate printers, but they are very, very affordable and then make a very good model for the cost. What that allowed us to do was, it allowed us to produce the 3D printed model from the STL file at half the cost of the, the bigger brands out there with the huge printers. And from our point of view, it doesn't really matter if the printers build a build platform in one hour, two hours, three hours. We close at about 8 p.m. at night and we open again 6 p.m., 6 a.m. in the morning. So as long as those printers have printed everything reliably for us to start work again at 6 a.m., then it doesn't really matter um, how how quickly it was printed. They'll just lie on the build platform for kind of, you know, one hour, two hours, three hours. So the Form Labs printers came along. They're virtually plug and play. You know, we have a very, very high success rate. We very rarely have any failures with them, but it allowed us to produce a 3D printed model at half the cost of the other systems. Um, so that's what we do. So we started off with one Form Labs printer, and then we bought two, and then three, and then four, and we currently have 12. So we run these every night. We run them during the day if we have to, um, and we, we print all of the models at an affordable price. So what we, the way it works in the National Health Services, and probably the same in the US, is you have to have a start treatment model. So you have to know what the crooked teeth look like beforehand, and then you have to do the treatment, and then, and then you have to have a, a study model digital of what the teeth look like nice and straight. So what we decided to do was, if you've got a scanner, whichever scanner it is, then you don't need the study casts of pre and post treatment. So if you can substitute the cost, the laboratory cost of having those plaster models into the cost of the printed models, then you have exactly the same lab bill. So we used to charge whatever price it was for the study models, that's how much we charge for the printed model. Then that way the clinician's lab bill digitally is exactly the same as it was doing it via the impression material. The only way we could do that was to find a more cost-effective printer, which was reliable, and that's where we, we got into Form Labs and they've been fantastic. And we just keep growing and keep, they're virtually plug and play. So you plug them in, you, if you know what you're doing with them, which we do now, um, they're very, very reliable. And we can keep getting 14, 16, 18 in a big bank of these printers. And that's kind of why we have it on our website, because they're very good for us, they're very reliable for us. Yeah. Now, Form Labs, that's uh, right up the street from Boston. Those are a bunch of MIT boys. Uh, yeah. So uh, they're headquartered in Brighton. Uh, so who do you work with there? Do you, is it Samuel Wainwright or who's your... Who's no, your we, we, don't, we don't work directly with, uh, with Form Labs in Boston because they have UK what's called on sellers. So we work with there. We work with John Winter in the in the UK and the Dental Directory, and we we buy our printers from them, and they're the on sellers. But we do have um, we do have connections with Form Labs, obviously, because they've just sent a Boston film crew over to our place in Sunderland in the UK, and they spent two lovely days filming with us. And I think the video is just about to come out on their website. And um, so we show them the sights of Sunderland and how we've grown a a small lab from started in my garage, kind of 18 years ago how we've now turned it into a, um, a huge laboratory, 12,000 square feet with um, over 50 staff. And it was no doubt that um, probably three, four years ago, we were doing around about 2% of our work digitally. Now we're up to 15% 
and it's the fastest growing area within the orthodontic laboratory. So tell me the so, dates on those. You, when was it 2%? What year? Probably two years ago. Yeah. So 2016, it was 2%. Yeah. And 2018, it's 15%. I mean, that, that, that's crazy growth. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, 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 that's crazy. Where, where do you think uh, it's going to be in 2020? Oh, I think it's going to be at least 50 50. Um, I think the way that they're training the, the dentists as well is probably going to change in the next, you know, two to three years. Um, a lot of the dentists are trained via traditional methods. <laughs> And they enhance their training normally postgraduate with um, digital techniques um, tends to be via continual professional development. I think within a very short space of time, once the teaching establishments have got the money to invest in this digital technology, it will end up being digital teaching with a little bit of traditional. This is how we used to do it. Um, whereas I think at the minute it's this is how we do it. But these are the options going forward. And I do feel that, you know, within a very short space of time, then the, the training will have to dictate by the digital technology. I think it's going to be 50-50 within a very short space of time and maybe even more the other way. Yeah. So England, so the United Kingdom has 65 million people. How many, how many dentists and how many orthodontists do they have? I think there's around about 25,000 dentists. If, don't quote me on these figures, it's around about that. And I think there's about three and a half thousand orthodont specialist orthodontists. Now, do the, um, do the orthodontist and the um, general dentist, do they work? Do they play nicely together in the playground? Or is there a lot of animal spirits competitors? Uh, um, how would you? They used to play very nicely. There was a good referral process in place between kind of dentists and orthodontists. If it was a very simple case, they would maybe think about doing it in house. Um, if, if it was more complex, they would have no problem in referring to an orthodontist to do. Um, I think with the onset of um, better training, more available training, there are more and more general dentists um, branching out into offering orthodontics to mm -hmm. adult patients. Um, in the UK, you have to be a specialist to get a, an NHS contract, so that tends not to be the case. But with adult patients, there are more and more dentists now actually taking on board training where they can offer the, the easier cases. I think there's a gray area in between of, um, you know, do you do, the, do you do the slightly more complex ones or do you refer? And I think what you've just touched on there, there used to be a general referral process. Now there's more and more dentists saying, you know what, I think I can do this myself with some training and mentoring, I think I can do it. So they've realized that there is an adult market out there. So there's the, a lot more doing it themselves very successfully. We've seen some very good cases so there's an argument between the two <laughs> dentists and orthodontists that should who should be straightening teeth, who shouldn't be straightening teeth. And I think really that there's no definitive answer. You should only act within the realms of your competence. If you've treated 50 simple cases with of adult orthodontics, then you know should you be told you can't do that? But equally, if you've got a dentist coming out who's had no experience and wants to take on right at the very top of the, what they should be treating on the first case, then yes, there's an argument that you should refer as well. But I think if you've got a system in place where there's a good communication between them, some definite mentoring, some definite teaching, and there's a lot of orthodontists now taking that stance that, you know what, I think these guys are doing a great job in certain cases. And if we can help them choose the right cases, then everybody can play nicely again. Yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me of uh, MacArthur's uh, island hopping strategy in the uh, World War II where the Japanese would go um, fortify an island, they'd be all ready for the attack, and MacArthur would just sail around them and attack their supply line behind them and until they ran out of food and water and ammo. And he always said, starvation from my ally, why these orthodontists have been fighting with General Dennis and Bisline went right around and said, you know what, we don't, we don't need either of you. They're opening up scanning bars in Manhattan right next to these Apple Genius bars and there's little yeah. cute girls in uh, skirts and high heels yeah. taking oral yeah. scanners and they're sending that scan to Costa Rica and they're making trays yeah. and they, they own 17% of Smiles Drug Club. And when it comes to orthodontists, I'm sorry, as a general dentist, I mean, I, I, I see uh, it's dysfunctional. I mean, when you're in yeah. dental school and you're working on a child, any pediatric dentist will help you. If you're working on a root canal, any endodontist will help you. If you're trying to pull a tooth, every oral surgeon will help you. Every specialist bends over their back trying to help you except the orthodontist yes. and then the, and they, they, they think in fear and scarcity why they're sitting there 
thinking in fear and scarcity with the general dentist that if he gets an Invisalign case, then the orthodontist will get one less, not realizing that the overall orthodontic market is skyrocketing. And, yeah. um, and then number two, while the orthodontist is all worried about the general dentist referral, Invisalign says, screw both of you, I don't need either of you guys. Is there smiles <laughs> direct going on in the UK? Yeah, I think it's starting to already. In the, I think in the capital and a couple of cities around the UK, there's a there's rumours that they're opening there as well. The same thing, direct to the public. Um, it's a difficult one, you know. From our side of the fence, it's um, we don't really have an opinion on whether it's right or it's wrong. It's it's not really our field. It's one of those ones that let them fight it out in court and let them do those things. But if you can get more people, from our point of view, if you can get more people into treatment, whichever method it comes from then they all need retainers at the end of the day. And if you can provide that, you know, then that's the main thing. Keep the teeth straight. Let them argue between themselves of which is the right or the wrong way. Personally, I would always go and see an orthodontist if I had, if I wanted my teeth straightened. Um, yeah, I mean, if you got the money to buy a car, you only want to buy it from Japan or Germany. And then if you yeah. don't have that much money, then you consider buying a car from the UK, America, or Korea. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah. if you got the money, yeah, I, I would only, I would only buy a, only two countries know how to make a car, and it's Germany and Japan. But then if you don't yeah. have the money, sometimes you got to buy a Chevy or a Ford or a Chrysler yeah. or a Hyundai. Uh, and uh, so, and, and then and then some people are going to take the bus. And I, I yeah. it'll be interesting to see how the Smiles Direct plays out because I know it's ruffling all kinds of feathers. But I do know this: this is what the this is what the dentists and the orthodontists want to hear. The yeah. only historical trend for 150 years that helps everyone is intense competition. And, and yeah. if you start passing laws and putting protectionism in place and not let like the NHS contract, only letting orthodontists deliver it, not general dentists, anything you do um, to make it, the environment less competitive, then everybody gets less stuff for more money and it's just not good. I mean, I, right now they're talking about all these trade deals and uh, yeah. NAFTA and all that stuff. And the United States could get out of every single deal if they just said, we have zero tariffs coming in or coming out. We don't care how stupid your country is. No regulation, no import, no export. And my God, you know how many companies would move here tomorrow from around the world and set up their factories if you would just yeah. uh, quit playing those games. So um, explain to <clears throat> the young millennial, she's uh, 25, she just got out of school and she, um, she didn't learn any ortho in school because the orthodontist department thought in fear and scarcity, but uh, she learned endo and oral surgery and all that stuff. And she sees a case and she's gonna do it, but she's thinking of straightening these teeth. Tell her the importance of retention because she's not even at that part of the end. She, she's, never, she's never even seen a case relapse. What, 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 should, what, what would be the top three things to be thinking about on retention? And um, finishing that case. Yeah, I think um, retention for me personally, it's the most important part of any tooth straightening process. It has to be. You have to get to that end result and then you have to keep it. And if you can't keep it, it's like having a house that looks great but then, you know, it falls down a few years' time. So you've got to make sure that whatever she's treatment planning, the retention element has to be taken in right at the start. And she's got to think. How can I offer this to a patient? But actually, I don't want to offer that patient something which, um, you know, like you went back to the car scenario. It's all right saying, yes, you can have this one, but you know, she might be at the top, the patient might be at the top end of the budget. So therefore you can have this one because it does a pretty good job, but this one is okay. You really need to be thinking, how can I stabilize those teeth long-term? What would I do to stabilize them? And for me, it comes down to a wire bonded retainer, on the back of the teeth. My wife's had hers on for probably 25 years now. Upper and lower or probably. just lower? Oh, on all, uh, upper and lower, yeah. Uh, your wife has a, uh, so you recommend on retention a, a fixed wire on the maxillary and mandibular, upper and lower? Absolutely, okay. yes, on, on both arches, um, and then also a removable retainer, which you can, it's your choice, which you want personally. I love the old fashioned wire and acrylic ones, but the patients don't. So ultimately it comes down to whatever we think's the right one. I know for a fact that I couldn't get my wife to wear a pallet and a wire, even though it would probably last longer and it would give a lot of adjustment to where it was needed. 
she simply wouldn't wear it. So it could be the best retainer in my mind, but if she doesn't wear it, it's the worst retainer. So we have to find something that's um, visibly, aesthetically pleasing, which there's nothing better than a clear type Invisalign retainer. Um, but you want the strength of a wire on the back. Now, depending on which wire you choose, there's different options there as well. Um, but if you can combine a wire on the back of the teeth, both mandible and maxilla, you have a removable retainer of choice of the patient that they're actually going to physically wear as opposed to keeping the top drawer. You've got much more chance then of keeping the teeth straight. So, if, so from my point of view, you don't want to make the patient choose which is the most affordable retainer. They have to have the option of the best retainer at the affordable price. And that to me is where I feel we can bring our product to the market. And there's no geographic boundaries. There's no reason why anybody shouldn't send scans to the UK. You know, it's, it's, it's the same time scales as whether you send it from, you know, 10 miles away or 100 miles away. So I think for us, it's about doing the morally right thing, which is everybody thought we were crazy when we, we, we halved the price of our retainers. So, so, um, so you're, um, Recommending these uh, for the fixed wire retainers, they, they come in in a scan and then you make it in a, a deal so it's easy, faster, easier to cement. Yeah. Do you do well, that with what brackets we also do too? As well. Do you do that for brackets? Yeah, yeah. We do an awful lot with brackets. And I think one of the key questions we were always asked is, um, if I take the brackets off the teeth, how soon can you get my retainers back? And it used to be, I have to use a local lab because they're just around the corner and they can get them back next day for me and we don't want the teeth drifting. But with the technology they can use now, 3Shape, the ortho analyzer one, we can digitally remove the brackets. You can scan the patient with brackets on and remove the arch wires and the modules, scan it with the brackets on, send it to the lab. We can digitally remove those brackets. We can 3D print the model as if there was no brackets there. And in that, we can make a wire bonded retainer. We can make a um, removable retainer, whitening trays, all of those things and all back in the surgery before you've removed a bracket from the patient. So how quick do you need them? Before the patient's debonded? Absolutely. You can't get better than that. Zero chance of relapse. And if you can do all of those things and not charge a premium price, then surely that's the way to go. In my opinion, it's the way forward. So have your retainers before you finish treatment. <laughs> How do you deliver that retrain? Do, do you deliver it so it's in a, a seating uh, device? So you, you you take off the yeah. brackets and then uh, and what, what do you call yeah, that? What yeah. do you call that delivery system? We do our own. We've got a, a retainer that we use. Um, to the hardest bit when you're fitting the wire bonded retainer, from everybody says to me, is you need three hands. It's very difficult to try and hold it in place and bond it and stop the, the, the bond from flowing everywhere. So we invented our own system called the silicon stent bonded retainer (SSBR). And essentially what we do is we position the wire on the back of the teeth, particularly that the upper one's very important to do this because you need to check the occlusion. So we will bend the wire, we'll position it where it should be on the teeth so it doesn't interfere with occlusion. How do you check that? It's very difficult to check that if you're making some form of carrying jig. So what we do is we actually wax the wire onto the back of the 3D printer model. Uh, we use the exact size, shape, saucer pads and then we close the arctic down and you can see if it's catching and then what we do is we actually have a flowable clear silicon which we then inject over the teeth to make a very thin mouth guard type of carrying tray we boil the wax out the wire is held in the silicon and you've got little saucer shaped indentations which means that you literally etch the teeth a little bit of composite pass it into the mouth like cure peel the tray off and there you go a little bit of clean up and you're done Treatment Are these time. videos on your website? Um, we're just in the process of getting those finished off. We've got some that will be coming out on the Form Labs website. We've Are got you, some still images. Now, on the yeah. Form Labs, do you, do you put that into a YouTube file and then give it to Form Labs, or what, what file are um, they, they going to? They did their own film of, filming of it, so it will be coming out via their website. And then once they've released it, because obviously we can't steal, steal their thunder, once they've released it, we'll then be able to upload it to our YouTube channel. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, again, that's in fear and scarcity. So many of these companies, they put their videos on their website and, you know, they'll, they'll use a format where it only plays on their website. So now the world has two million dentists that would gladly share this on Facebook, Twitter, Dental Town, Orthodan. I, I, I don't know how they can do that, but I, I wish you would um, on Dental Town, uh, there's 50 categories. 
and one of them orthodontics. I wish you would load those videos on under orthodontics. Now, now see, again, yep. again, back to the specialists. All the specialists, some of the greatest oral surgeons, pediatric dentists, and they're all on dental tap. I mean, like yeah. 25,000 of them regularly. I mean, regularly. Um, yeah. And um, But the orthodontist, we had to set up a whole different site, and it's called Orthotown, and I can't even yeah. go on it, and I own the damn website. You, <laughs> and, and then what's sad is, like, you're an orthodontic lab. You can't go on there. And I, I yeah. tell them, I'm like, well, you got to have communication with your vendors. you got to work the value chain. And I have all these orthodontic companies always ask me, well, do you know what they say on Orthotown about this or that or this or that? I'm like, well, why don't you ask the damn orthodontist to let you on? And they're yeah. like, no, we don't want anybody on. I mean, you're either a, a, a board certified orthodontist or you're, I guess you're a Neanderthal, Cro-Magnum, Peking man, uh, knuckle dragger. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, they're a hard tribe. Uh, to understand, <laughs> they really are. They're extremely tribal. Uh, but I think um, I, I think these dentists get out of school. I, I, I see two types of dentists when they come out of school. They're either like me, uh, what I call an apical barbarian, blood and guts. I mean, we do a root canal. We want to get all the way to the end and have a puff of sealer out at the apex. We love pulling teeth. We love laying flaps. Love perio implant. We love we love blood. And then there's this other group of dentists. Um, I call them um, uh, pulp lovers. Uh, when they get to the end of the, the root canal, they want to stay a half a millimeter from the apex and get it all nice and pretty. And, 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 um, and they like bleaching, bonding veneers. And they like all this stuff. And, and, they're, they're, and they're, just, they're just two, probably the two main categories of dentists. April barbarian blood and guts are pulp loving, fluffy white. And, and if they like that fluffy white stuff, what you're telling them is they need to start getting into orthodontics. I mean, it's one of the fastest, I mean, orthodontics and implants are the only two sectors of the economy and dentistry that's growing two to three times the rate of the dental economy. I mean, if the dental economy is growing 3%, the implants and ortho is growing six, eight, 9%. I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's explosive growth and it all comes down to anthropology. At the end of the day, um, uh, all animals, uh, just want to eat, drink, and reproduce, have offspring. And I remember when we were little, they thought all the the, the uh, scales along those dinosaurs was that so they could catch the morning sun when it was perpendicular to it and start spinning it'd be some evolutionary advantage to warm up their blood faster and that'd give them advantage. They find out all that stuff is just sexual. It's all like the peacock. It's all for mating. Um, I think the um, that's why it's huge. I mean, makeup, lipstick. I mean, it's crazy. In Asia... Um, it's really neat going to another tribe and when you start looking at their beauty to make you realize how all beauty is just so silly. I mean, it's like a peacock. I mean, if the peacock spanned his feathers in front of you, would that do it? Would that do anything to you? But they do that in front of a, a female and she's like paralyzed. I mean, she's just like, she didn't know what to do. And I, I just still think the bizarrest thing in, in orthodontics is that when you go to Asia, you see that girl making $3,000 a year or spending a thousand on Bizline and why? Because when she takes her finger from her nose to her chin, the lip can't touch. And she's trying to pull it back. And then when you go to the Western world, all the women are taking Dermafil and puffing their lips up like Donald Duck. And it's like, uh, and the bottom line is the men in both villages, no man in America wants to be married to that Donald Duck's, you know, Dermafil lip. And nobody in China gives a crap for that woman's lip is in proportion to her nose and her chin they, they, they just perceive this so they got to wear the high heel they got to wear the shoe they got to wear the 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 um they, so invisalign bleaching bonding veneers i mean it's going to be huge till the end of time as long as there's a species wanting to reproduce and have offspring they're going to want to look younger better uh all that kind of stuff so it's fast growth so what will my homies find if they go to your website Say that again, sorry, Howard. What will my homies find if they go to your website, ashfordorthodontics.co.com? Yeah, they'll say a little bit about us. They'll say about where we've grown from and where we go to. Um, they'll say a little bit about the Retainer World brand, about what we try to do with that image and make it affordable to people. Um, they'll say a little bit about the history of the company, how we started from a garage and now we're the largest ortho lab in the UK. 
So I think what also as well, what you touched on on there, Howard, and, and what we try to do is when you've just said orthodontics is the fastest thing, the fastest growing thing, what we've also got to remember in this is that we need to train the people who can provide the services to fulfill this uh, this marketplace. So it's a skill. And the skills now are changing from traditional skills to digital skills. Um, but we can't ever forget the traditional route. We need to have a good blend because like you've just said about the people want Invisalign, there's still people need the functional appliances, they need to correct the mandible, there's still all of that. And that's a dying breed out there. And if we just turn our attention to purely digital, then this is going to be forgotten about. There's only going to be old dinosaurs like me and Graham who can actually bend these appliances like Bionators and Frankles and things. So we need to be able to sustain this market by training people. And one of the things that we like to do is to, to bring people in as dental technicians, but then give them the opportunity to train to become orthodontic technicians. And I think we mustn't forget that. In, you know, it's easy to think digital is the future, which it is, but you haven't got to forget traditional as well. Yeah. And I just want to say you look mighty dapper and charming in that photo. <laughs> My God, you, you shine up, Penny, like you shine up very bright. <laughs> Tell me why you were in a tuxedo looking all handsome and pretty in your tuxedo. Well, that night, that particular night, we actually we won the award um, in our region for business of the year, for medium business of the year. Um, because you know, we've got less than 50, 50 employees, but then they all went into the overall business, and there was about 25 winners went into the pot. And they chose the overall business and unbelievably ashford orthodontics won that as well so we got two trophies instead of one so we we particularly were pleased that night and so. two trophies from whom it's it's our regional business we have the portfolio awards in our area in our region so um they they voted for us you have to submit your applications first time we'd ever done it and um, what we what, what we don't like doing is actually applying for dental industry awards because I think there's a little bit of, you know, you, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and I might be wrong there. We prefer to go into business categories because ultimately, if, if you're going to have a business, it doesn't matter if you make widgets. It doesn't really matter. You've got to do what you do very well. You've got to keep a good team. You've got to have a good business model. And I see too many dental technicians working in the business rather than on the business. So we took it as a particular compliment that we run a good business. You know, we know how to look after customers. We know how to make really good widgets. We know how to price them well. We know how to sell those widgets. And we know how to look after the customers who buy those widgets. And I think for us, it was a bigger pat on the back to receive the business awards than it is to go down the dental awards. If that makes, not that I'm trying to you know, devalue the, the dental awards at all, but I think we were particularly pleased, as you can see from that photograph, that we actually made a stand for orthodontics within the business community. So it's a business rather than an orthodontic lab. And I think that's what we were most proud of that night. So it's a tribal, like even the Oscars. I mean, it's always a certain type of movie that wins the Oscars. I mean, it's uh, I'll never forget when uh, when Gandhi uh, beat ET. Okay, one's an autobiography. How creative genius is an autobiography, you know? And the other one is this complete innovation story you know what one was genius and one was a third grade autobiography well guess which one won because you can't have et win over mahatma gandhi i mean he's one of the you know yeah. the most important um leaders in the um in that time period um last thing on and um i i hope you get with form labs and i hope you um upload a lot of those videos on the uh, dental town when you when you go to make a post on dental town uh, there's a little YouTube button. So when, when you have a YouTube video, you know, you can hit share and it has a link. And that's something you can might post on Facebook. But it also yeah. has a button called embed. And you click embed and you copy that code, you can put in the whole YouTube video. And a lot of you guys out there um, that are podcasters, there's about 60 dental podcasts now in Dentaltown. Uh, we're, we're there, hardly any of them. Um, the reason we filmed this, even though I have a face for radio, the reason I do YouTube is because YouTube and Google are the two biggest search engines in the world. And, um, and the views, I mean, we're, we're up to 8,500 dentists subscribed to this podcast just on YouTube. And that one's growing uh, uh, very, very fast. And um, whenever a dentist makes a YouTube video, if they post it on Dental Town, uh, people subscribe to their channel and it really explodes. It's free marketing and explodes your YouTube channel. I want to ask one final question. Just because um, 
I would say at least half of our viewers are from the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And um, in America, um, um, this, I'm, I'm going I'm to ask this last so we can cut off, you know, and end. But uh, they're all sitting here thinking, what's up with Brexit? And uh, I don't like talking about politics, but there's two questions. Well, we don't get a lot of solid news coverage on 220 countries. I mean, you just get bits and pieces. But the two questions that most Americans ask about uh, the United Kingdom is, number one, uh, is, is Brexit are you, are, is Brexit good or bad? Do you think they'll go back to the EU? And number two, um, is EU uh, still going to be there in, uh, in 10 years? Personally, my personal opinion on this, Brexit's bad for the UK. I think we, we are part of Europe. I think it's the unknown. Nobody will really know what it's going to, I think, a lot of Europe, when you ask the second part of the question, they're waiting to see what happens with the UK. Because I think there's a lot of people, if it works well for us, then I think a lot of people will say, well, actually, we don't want to be part of the, the EU. But actually, I think there was a lot of misinformation given when people decided to vote for Brexit. Pretty sure if you had the same vote now with without the lies that were told, then I think you'll find a different vote and we wouldn't be leaving the EU. So I think there was a lot of misinformation given. There was a lot of people used it for particular agendas rather than looking at the overall picture. There was some bad advertising, which was how much money was wasted and proves to be a lie afterwards and nobody's held accountable for that. Um, I think if you had that vote now, I, th I think personally, although they say there's not going to be a second vote, I think the way it's going now, the way it's been handled, because nobody knows what to do about it, I think it's heading that way. I think it's heading for a second vote, even though everyone says it won't. But I think if there was a second vote now, you wouldn't get the same result. I honestly wouldn't. I think there's a um, there's a lot of companies out there. We, in, where we are in Sunderland, we have the big Nissan plant. Um, it's a huge, they employ something like 25,000 people in our area and probably about the same again in, in add-on companies. Um, I think they're watching very closely. And I think it comes down to, can they still stay in the UK and do trade deals with the likes of the US and other countries? Nobody knows, nobody really knows, but I think it's it's one of those ones. Brexit to me isn't good. I, I'm, I would sooner have the devil I know than the devil I don't, um, just from business points of view, because business creates jobs and jobs creates income and everyone lives happily ever after. And I think once you upset the apple cart, you don't really know what's gonna happen. So they're all watching the UK. Um, I don't think the government's handled it very well at all. I don't think anybody knows what's going on properly. Um, there's no definitive answers to anything. So I think it's a case of ask us again in a year's time. I'll probably have a better idea. So. The United States has been uh, celebrating Brexit since 1776, and India has been selling it since 1949. But here's what, uh, in my take, because I have lectured in a dozen of those European countries several times each. And, you know, when the EU came along, it was really nice not to have to change your money uh, when you went from France to Italy and you know, all the money changers and all, all that kind of stuff like that. But that was all solved by the credit card. And my American Express doesn't care what country I'm in and, and, and the volumes and the trades and the transactions. But when I looked at uh, last year's number from The Economist where uh, who pays um, net contributions to the EU? Uh, Netherlands uh, is Netherlands, Sweden, Germany, Denmark, Finland, Austria, France, UK, Italy, and Ireland pay in pretty much pay in greatly more than they than they receive. And then look at the list who who gets more cash coming back than they paid in: Spain, Croatia, Cyprus, Belgium, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Portugal, Poland, Estonia, Slovenia, Latvia, Malta, Greece, Lithuania. Hungary, Luxembourg, and when I go lecture up there, when I'm up in those uh, northern uh, Denmark, Sweden, uh, Switzerland, Germany, um, the dentists don't have to drink too many beers at dinner to start really getting very upset about countries like Greece just running colossally insane policies. And so the question is, how long are the hardworking men in Denmark and Switzerland and Sweden and Norway and Germany going to subsidize um, Greece and Lithuania and Hungary? I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't. You're right. Yeah, I, I agree I, with you. I, I, I think and, that's I, and, and as an outsider, I mean, I, I'm sitting here, keep my mouth shut, sensing a lot of hostility. I mean, every time I go, it's not a pleasant conversation. And it seems yeah. to be getting worse. So it's so I don't know. But anyway, hey, I just want to. Uh, I hope you share your videos 
on uh, Ortho on uh, you you can't log on to Ortho Town because um, you have to be a spiritual leader or an orthodontist or a god. You have, you have to be above Gandhi and to the left of, of uh, Buddha. Uh, but uh, I hope I hope you share those videos on uh, Ortho um, okay. on uh, on Dental Town and tell Form Labs that their their best marketing isn't on their own website. Um, Google, yeah. Google says there's 1.6 billion websites and half of them are active. So putting yeah. a video on your own website, I mean, that, that's why Facebook is so powerful because you're sharing it. So to put yeah. that to yeah. put that video on Dental Town, um, um, when there's a quarter million dentists on that thing, it'd be great marketing. But hey, thank you so much. So it's, uh, um, what, what time is it there? Seven o'clock? What are you getting ready to go to bed? Oh, no, just I've got another couple hours to do yet. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks no, so much for coming on the show today. Thanks very much, Howard. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Thanks very much.